Welcome, uh, friends. I was not supposed to be here. This uh, uh, Golden Jubilee lecture was to be chaired by Professor T. N. Madan, but Loki, unfortunately, for very personal reasons, cannot make it. Uh, so I have this very pleasant duty of uh, introducing Gananath. Uh, maybe once again, and uh, it's. Certainly gives me great pleasure in repeating that uh, Gananath is not only uh, one of us, he was uh, the Rajni Patari chair here, but he is also, as you all know, a great scholar, one of the greatest uh, living anthropologists uh, in the world. Uh, as an anthropologist, uh, Gananath has done much conventional fieldwork, uh, and that can be seen from his masterly sketches of the, of the firewalker, the frenzied dancer, the self-immolating priestess. All of these portraits can be found in his books, with Medusa's hair in particular, but, but, his, but his real uh, hallmark is, is uh, his <coughs> unconventional, unconventional unconventional ethnography uh, because he approaches the obscure objects of his intellectual passion by frequently ignoring local contexts. For example, I mean, this you find in the, his riveting study of the, of the, of the goddess Patini and the cults uh, and rituals that surround her uh, where, I mean, in, which was the result of an exploration which took him to several areas, uh, not only in Sri Lanka, but also in, in, in southern India, where the cult had initially died out or was assimilated uh, into the Kali or the Draupadi cult. So, so that, 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 that study that he did of Patini had to be not just ethnographic but also ethno-historical. And that's the, that's the nature of his, his, uh, his, his methodology. It keeps changing with the object that he is steadfastly pursuing. Uh, uh, he, it, he, if he gets hooked on to something, then he chases it no matter where it is and no matter how far it takes him. And he develops his methodology or his or his methodologies uh, that are most suitable to, to, or most adequate to the object that he's, or the subjects that he's studying. Each of his work is very high in ambition. Uh, each is a result of a new adventure. It's an exploration with a profound seriousness of purpose. It's always bold, but never, never reckless. Uh, and this approach has, as I said, yielded very rich dividends. He is a master. He's a great master uh, of, in his field. Uh, and indeed, a master of many fields. I mean, I, I mentioned anthropology, but if you take his work, if you see his work as a work in comparative religion, you would find him the same, same kind of outstanding count contribution. Uh, so, uh, so he would have very persuasively delineated the, the very subtle differences that there are between the Hindu and the Buddhist way of embracing uh, the same God. He would look at changes, uh, in, uh, how Hinduism changes Buddhism and how Buddhism changes Hinduism, how they interact and mutually influence one another. And it's not just comparative religion, it's, it's comparative anthropology, I think, uh, a field that he probably helped to pioneer. Uh, if you just look at the, and the people and the regions that are so scrupulously covered in imagining karma, Obey Sekre's classic study of the concept of rebirth, a topic that has received very little attention from anthropologists and historians alike, you'll find that the list of the, the, the peoples that he 
or the regions uh, that he covers is astonishing. Inuits, Trabianders, Theravada Buddhists, Vedic and Upanishadic followers, Jains, Ajivikas, Balinese, then the early Greek thinkers, Pythagoras, Plato, Neoplatonists, Plotinus, Pindar, the Orphics, and offshoots uh, uh, on the fringes of Islam, for example, the Druze and the, the related Isla Is Is Ismaili groups. I mean, it's, it's, the list is just staggering. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, uh, takes, really takes one's uh, breath away. But the other very fascinating thing about Gannat's work is that is the way he brilli brilliantly uh, is able to connect the, 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 the minute ethnographic details with, with larger theoretical insights. I'm particularly fond of, of, his, of the, 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 the concept of ethicization, which I myself used uh, in, in my uh, work. Um, I would say Craig draws a distinction there between the basic structure of rebirth eschatology uh, in which kinship affiliation decides who goes where after death, and the more complex karmic eschatology, where some other world or some other critical point becomes the, the site or the place or the vantage point from which retribution and punishment and so on takes place. And this is what he calls ethicization. I think it's a tremendously important contribution so I can, I can just go on, on, on and on. I mean, uh, Shell the other day talked about his critical engagement with Marshall Salin's work. Uh, uh, and one can spend hours just talking about that. But, <clears throat> but I think, uh, uh, I've, I've said enough. Uh, his, his writing is always extremely provocative. It's, it's eloquent, it's beautiful, and it's uh, perhaps because he did, a, a di did his first degree in English, and he, he claims that his, his, his uh, anthropological education also came through his readings of T.S. Eliot and Yeats, and um, his, lec his, his lectures are always performances. There is style in his lectures. There is great aplomb and, and there is passion, all of which you will see now. So may I now invite Kananath to come and deliver this Golden Jubilee lecture. Rajiv uh, mentioned passion. <coughs> At my age, I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot. I have lost my passion. Why should I need to keep it? Because what is kept must be adulterated. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid uh, after all that uh, wonderful uh, comments by Rajiv, this is the dangers of having a friend to do the introduction, you see. Um, I'm afraid um, this is going to be somewhat down to earth. I have to use both of these things. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you some idea of what I'm planning to uh, do here. Uh, it's a part of a larger project, you see. After I wrote. Um, um, what's the book I wrote recently? <laughs> the Awakened Ones. Yeah, the Awakened Ones. You see, my memory is giving away. After I wrote The Awakened Ones, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult book, and, uh, and far too long, there's nothing I can do about it. So after I wrote that, I thought I must get down to earth, you see. And what I was trying to do is to get back to my Sri Lankan material, you see, uh, my fieldwork material, um, and also produce a kind of critique of the kind of scholarly work that is being done 
in Sri Lanka, uh, both historical research and other kinds of research. Um, the way they look at Buddhism, for example, as if the rest of the world didn't exist, as if South India didn't exist, you see. And some of the texts that I'm now using, palm leaf manuscripts, which I have collected, <coughs> you see, deal with this fascinating problem of South Indian Tamil speakers, or even uh, perhaps Kerala speakers, coming down to Sri Lanka and being welcomed by the kings. Their names are changed, of course, naturally. <laughs> And they are given land, and they, <coughs> and they settled, you see. So we have a lot of these texts which no one has looked at before. In this particular study, however, what I'm trying to do is, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the title of my projected talk, uh, projected book, is um, The Past of Sri Lanka and the Dilemmas of History. And that's the focus. The problems, the dilemmas that the conventional way of looking at history has produced. I have written volume one, believe it or not, you see. <laughs> it's still in a sort of uh, pretty poor shape, but it's there. And the thing that I'm now re going to uh, deal with is uh, volume two, uh, the beginnings of volume two, God knows where it's going to end. Uh, which is uh, dealing with uh, a very fascinating and important period in, in Sri Lankan history, uh, the Kandy period, you see, where you had one of the most interesting kings who will appear and reappear in this text, uh, Vimala Dharma Surya, uh, the first, um, who was, uh, who became king around uh, 1580, you see, and, and I'm trying to look at the way, the, the funny thing is that if you look at the classical histories, Mahavansa, or the later Mahavansa, sometimes erroneously called the Chula Vansa, you see, or the singular text Raja Valya, uh, you, you know, you will not know that there was, this, this king had a, you know, a kind of cosmopolitan outlook. Because those texts only deal, quite rightly, I think, I mean, I'm not saying they're inventing it, you see, <coughs> with the work of religion that these, uh, the, the, all these kings, you see, the kings, uh, five or six kings uh, of the Kandy period, they came after Vimana Dharma Surya. So you know that this guy has done other things, if you had only those texts, you see. So what I'm going to do uh, uh, with this is, um, I will give you a sort of a, a real brief sketch of uh, the background of uh, Vimala Dharma Surya. He was the first anointed king of Kandy, you see. Prior to that, there were kings, most of them were what single people called Bandaras, namely aristocrats, you see. And there were three of those kings, and one of the most interesting of the three Bandara kings was the third Bandara king, just before Vimala Dharma Surya, uh, who became a Catholic, you see. I don't know what got into his head, but anyhow, <laughs> he became a Catholic and, uh, and proclaimed it foolishly. I mean, if he kept his mouth shut, he would think things would be okay. Anyhow, uh, at this time, the king of Kote, the Kota kings, which were really very powerful, also anointed kings of Kote, was a very, very powerful king called Rajasinga the First, you see. Now, uh, what this man, uh, this local ruler, foolishly did was he tried to attack Rajasinga the uh, Rajasinga, and of course he was completely trounced. He had to run away with his wife and his uh, family and his uh, nephew and both the wife and um, her husband and wife both died of smallpox. But the woman and the nephew went into Manor, that is on the uh, other side, uh, western side, northwestern side, where the Portuguese had their 
convent and very important figure. She was sort of then became, changed her name from Kusumasana Devi, you see, Kusumasana Devi, to Dona Katharina. <laughs> <laughs> I take that very seriously. Scholars still call her Kusumasana. I say, how the hell can you say that? Is she Dona Katharina? You see, she was uh, nurtured there and a completely committed Catholic. Now, what about Vimala Dharma Sugriya? He came from uh, a part of uh, what's called the Four Corollaries, that is, the, if you know a little bit of, it's on the sort of uh, what's called the Kagala district, a slightly mountainous area before we reach the big mountains in Kandy, you know. And this was really uh, a place where a lot of local kings uh, had power. I have a great deal of interest in these local kings who have been totally wiped out of the Sri Lankan historical map, you see. That's a very crucial part of my project, uh, the Tukam project, you see. Anyhow, this person's uh, father was called Virasundara Bandara, who was a local chief in that area, and he came from a town called Peradeni Nuvar. Now, everyone thinks that Peradeni is where our university is located. They are all wrong, you see. It is a town in this place called the Four Coralays, and uh, it had nothing to do with Peradeni. He's the local chief of that area. Now, his father was, uh, uh, you see, at this time, of course, then Raja Singh was the first chased the legitimate, the ruler, and he had occupied this area. And uh, Virasundara Bandara, therefore, uh, was sort of uh, the kind of, you know, local boss. But Raja Singh, who was understatement to call him slightly paranoid, but you see, <laughs> he uh, um, sus was very suspicious of Virasundara Bandara, enticed him to his capital, and killed him in the most brutal fashion, utterly brutal fashion. Then his son, who was at this time called Konappu Bandara, you see, fled to the kingdom of Kote. At this time, the kingdom of Kote, the chief, uh, the, 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 the uh, sovereign ruler was Dharmapala, who was a Christian, the first Christian <coughs> monarch in, in, in Kandy. Uh, that is the anointed monarch, who then in 1580, I'm not sure of these dates, but, uh, you know, right? but somewhere in 1580, he donated his kingdom to the Portuguese crown. You know. Now, after that Asinine Act, you see, uh, our friend Korapu Bandara came into uh, Kote uh, to seek refuge, and he was welcome there. And he married uh, a local chief, called, daughter of a local chief, who was called Sembaha Perumal. Mm -hmm. Now, we are powerful singular name, you would think, you know, but, uh, uh, but he's a Perumal, for heaven's sake, you see. And he was also called Bala Surya, younger Surya. Now, the thing about this Surya, in terms of my current work, I, I show that these Suryas belong to a clan who which descended from the sun, not the classical sort of uh, uh, sons in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Sri Lankan history, but a local king, you see. And this, all these people had the name Surya after them, you see. So for the first time, you have this name, increasing prominence. They were dominated the area in, in what is now called the Kurunagala district and going right down to the west coast, you see. And a very, very powerful clan. <coughs> no one has mentioned their names. We went to his fortress, and it's a fabulous place, steep place, and we uh, then, you know, uh, worked on the history of the, these local kings. Anyhow, what happened then was 
Vimala Dharma Surya had uh, killed someone, you see. He married the daughter of, 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 of Bala Surya, uh, but he had killed someone and the Portuguese banished him to Goa, you see. Uh, I think this first marriage was also a Catholic one because it was in the court of Dharma Bhara. So I assume that he was baptized there. And the singular text called him Kulavadi, you see. Um, and uh, anyhow, he, he, there he became very, very famous because he was a swordsman and he learned, I'm proud to say, his swordsmanship in. Uh, training schools in Sri Lanka. <laughs> so well, no wonder that when a, when a very, very powerful uh, local warrior came, our friend could split him into two, you see. Pretty sharp swords that they had at that time, I'm sure. <laughs> Anyhow, after this, um, after this, when, uh, the Portuguese thought this is a good guy to take him into Sri Lanka, you see, to rescue uh, the kingdom uh, and so forth and make it a Portuguese colony. So they sent the first contingent with Portuguese soldiers to Sri Lanka. What our friend did was he chased them away, changed his name from Konapu Bandara to Vimala Dharma Surya, Surya of the pure Dharma. In other words, he turned his older name, which was Don Juan, Don Jao or Austria, his baptismal name, and then gave this terrific singular uh, uh, name, you see. Not, there is no Surya in the whole history of Sri Lanka, that if you take their genealogy, no women of Dharmas either. So he was the first to have this and also a local guy became, becoming a very important figure. Now, the Portuguese undeterred, undeterred thought, well, since they are the, you know, the kingdom has been given to them on a plate, so to speak, you see, they will then get Dona Catarina to come up, you see, in a huge force into Candy and make her there. But the thing about Vimana Dharma Suri was familiar with both Portuguese techniques as well as Sri Lankan guerrilla warfare. He had no chance, you see. He wiped out the whole uh, regiment and captured Jonah Katharina and married her. <laughs> <laughs> you see, now that has all sorts of implications which I'm going to deal with. So Vimala Dharma Surya then um, was uh, yeah, yeah. Now I the position I take is that Vimala Dharma Surya reflects a modernity that has not yet was not permitted to come into being. I'm sure how it got, got squashed at a certain point, you see. His queen, Dona Catarina, was viewed by the Portuguese as a rightful heir. Uh, she was a, we don't know anything about her forced marriage, or whether it was a forced even. Uh, but is this the case that she was a faithful and gentle lady, a tragic figure, dead at the age of 35, having born four sons and one daughter? Uh, Sri Lankan historians, as I told you, see her uh, as Kusumas and Devi which in my view is ridiculous because she is, she is Dona Katharina. So it makes therefore some sense for early Dutch sources, I, I picked the Dutch sources from 1602, where you had uh, Dutch emissaries coming into uh, Candy, where the Dutch sources say, Dona Katharina visits no pagodas. This might be a bit of an exaggeration, but basically I think she was a genuine, faithful Catholic, and even if she went to so-called pagodas, you see, uh, it would be a, just a formality. The difference between the king and the queen in this respect is quite interesting, you see. That is, 
women of Dharma Surya is, is a complete pragmatism, like many singular people and singular kings. That is, they, on the one hand, it's fine. You could worship Jesus, you could worship Vishnu. No, there's no problem there, you see. So he became, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's nothing there to worry about. He was born and raised as a Buddhist, and that's what he, his self-identity was. And most of the, uh, the Mahavansa texts refer to his great Buddhist works. Some of it is quite interesting because um, uh, now that he's a Buddhist king, and here, I, unfortunately, I can't go into a, a detailed uh, thing here, but my larger text, uh, what's his name? Praveen has a copy of my larger text, and you can read that and, uh, if, you know, if you have the patience. Um, what happened was, one of the things he did, one of the first things he did was that the, the sacred tooth of the Buddha was uh, hidden somewhere by monks. He brought it into Kandy. Now, I have just a brief statement on the significance of this because it is so different from the Hindu way of looking at kings, you see. That is, if you, just a sort of quick thumbnail sketch, is that you are not a Buddhist king unless you have the uh, tooth relic, you see. You are not a Buddhist king. So you have kings who have been consecrated once, consecrated twice, but they are, it's nothing. You've got to have the tooth relic, you see. And the tooth relic is housed, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful cosmic symbol, you see. It is housed in the premises with the king. The king cannot be, you know, cannot be part of that whole thing. And as we know from even the way we talk of the Buddha, we call the Buddha as Buddha Rajanan Vansi. You see, the Buddha king, or Buddha Hamaduro, the Buddha monk, you see. In, when you are in, uh, in, in the palace, it's called the palace of the tooth relic, you see. Uh, if you look at the tourist books, they say temple of the tooth relic. It ain't so, you see. It's called the Maligao, palace, you see. The palace of the tooth relic, therefore, uh, it becomes a very, very important thing that legitimizes the kings, you know. And not only that, along with that, till at least the 14th century, there was another very powerful symbol, and that is the bowl relic of the Buddha, that is, uh, symbolically, that is to ensure plenty, the horn of plenty idea, you see, uh, in that. Anyhow, he took the tooth relic there and built a magnificent palace, but one you must remember again in terms of the Indian material, that is, if you look at Madurai or some such place, you have fantastic temples, you have fantastic palaces, not in Sri Lanka. The palace is a small place, it's sometimes nothing but a little hut. They must have other places outside the temple complex, you see, but within the temple complex, nothing can outshine the palace of the tooth relic. You see, so some powerful kings like Prakrambhau the first had a tiny hole in the wall, you see. And he had a lot of hair and how, how they could have been accommodated. Yeah, I just don't know. I suspect the king had also uh, palaces outside. But within that, you cannot have a palace that can outshine the Buddha's relic. Right down to our own times, that has been a, a thing. Now, now I, I'm not going to a discussion of, of the good works that the king has done. The Mahavansa, the Chulavansa gives a lot of details on that, and he has done a lot of good, you see. That is the, that's a standard thing that every king does. So, uh, I don't find that particularly, in this case, very interesting. <coughs> now, both Dona Catarina and Vimala Dharma Surya were familiar with Portuguese customs, and what was striking is their adaptation of Western ways of living. However, um, well, anyhow, by, according to Dutch uh, accounts, Vimala Dharma Surya was a great innovator. 
and probably the first king to have his own vineyard. The person after my own heart. <laughs> uh, the Dutch envoy, De Vere, mentions that the king had in his hand a gold cup full of wine made from the grapes that grew in his own house and presented it to me to drink. The Spielbergen embassy of 1602 recorded that on visiting the court, they noticed many Spanish chairs and a table, all of which was arranged in the Christian fashion. You see. The king himself, during this short spell with the Dutch, took some of the Dutchmen into the services of the court, even began to learn several instruments. Spielbergen, the ambassador, was brought to the chamber of the queen. Later, you know, you couldn't think of it that they would do that. Chamber of the king, queen, where she sat with her children, the prince and the princess, two of them at that time, who were all dressed in the Christian fashion. This, of course, might be to please the guests, but it is also very likely that the dress of the king and perhaps also some of the dominant chiefs were influenced by Portuguese fashions. Paul E. Pires, one of our better historians, some of them are pretty awful, <laughs> summed up the situation nicely. He said, for a century, Portuguese ideas molded the fashion of the court in candy. You see? Women of Dharmasurya, relative to the later Nayaka regimes that came in, you see, the Nayaka regimes after the last king of Sri Lanka, Narendra Singh, uh, the Nayakas from Madurai uh, took over the kingship. Um, I'll deal with that briefly later. So the thing to remember is that in this place, quite unlike the later Nayakas, we would be horrified, uh, distinguished foreign visitors just for free, you see, came in, met the queen, the children, and so forth, you know. <coughs> and De Vyat says that after he greeted Bimala Dharma Surya in the manner of our country, with one knee on the ground, you see, he was also permitted to see his children in front of him. Further, the Spielbergen embassy noted that when he became king, Bimala Dharma Surya had, I quote, all the new buildings constructed according to the Christian style, you see, and mentions well-constructed, well-equipped populations in that area, you see, towns in that area, in the kingdom. As for the residents, I quote again, they are well-off and well-clothed, and when they describe the kinds of, you know, uh, interesting uh, Cats and so forth that wore uh, vests, uh, as they wore doublets, and adorned with rings. As for the women, their clothes are neat, and they themselves are well fashioned in body and appearance. Of course, single women didn't wear any, so you know, brassieres, they, they were bare breasted, and uh, the ambassador said they are very shy. No wonder with those white guys poking at them, you see. So, so that is the reason, I mean, not that they were quite free in their own towns. So, in this manner, I quote again, the Sinhalese, adults as, as well as children, go about. They wear silver and gilded necklaces round their necks and rings on their fingers and toes round their arms, also decorated with precious stones. Their houses are beautiful, and well constructed, you see. It is incredible, that picture, when you think of what happened later on, as I would point out with the now coming of the night house, you see. And none of, none of that was allowed, you see. Anyhow, what you therefore have uh, is some difficulty in reconciling this wonderful picture with Robert Knox, who wrote about the villagers in the Sri Lankan area, and though he wrote how, quite well that wherever people can, they dress well and so forth, uh, nice postures and, 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 and all that, but basically living in small huts, you see. So I suspect that this is true of Kandy, which is the main city, and it is also true of <coughs> the other 
main cities in the area because we have other evidence uh, about that. Anyhow, Women of Dharmasurya followed therefore European styles also in welcoming Dutch ambassadors. For example, when he embraced the Dutch general Spielbergen and being such a powerful figure, he actually raised him up, you see. There's a beautiful picture of the king shaking hands in Western style with Spielbergen. And De Vere, the next uh, ambassador, says that when the king was with some of his counselors, he tried to kiss the king's hand as a token of honor, but the king took me in his arms, squeezed me heartily, so that my ribs cracked. <laughs> you see? Not an easy guy to get on with, I'm afraid. Anyhow, uh, the, the, a Dutch historian, um, uh, Valdez, has a wonderful account, a summary account of the king. I, I don't want to read it because we have no time, but basically he says about the king, his, his strong physique, handsome quality, and he, he said, I quote a little bit, he was a discerning statement, statesman, knew how well to preserve the kings and princes, except the Portuguese whom he hated. He ridiculed the idea of all religious tenets, permitting everyone a free exercise of it, according to their own will and pleasure. In fact, he was in every sense a Finnish courtier. This might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it does convey uh, the sense of this man. Now the next king, what is interesting is the, uh, his mother's sister's son, who was, a, who was a monk, who gave up his robes, and he was called Senarat, or Senaratna, you see. That is, in singular kingship, he would be uh, a brother, you see, a <coughs> classificatory brother. He also married Dona Katharina and had uh, a child from her, the great Raja Singha II. Uh, one of the truly powerful kings of Kandy, you see. Anyhow, what, I'm, um, what is interesting is that none of these kings uh, were hostile uh, to uh, foreigners uh, at all, you see, um, including at this time, a lot of, uh, uh, in that case in the reign of Raja Singha, a lot of the uh, Portuguese fled the Dutch areas and the king welcomed them. And also, in the case of Senarat, uh, 4,000 4, Portuguese, uh, sorry, Muslim people were banished into Kandy by the Portuguese and he then put them in the east coast. What had happened to them, we just don't know the demographics of that, you see. But it's quite interesting. And of course, these are, these are all politically motivated, but that's not all there is to it. And of course, uh, the, um, the Muslims are a very important influence. They provided the Candian kings with certain key items, salt, dry fish, fabrics, and foreign items like uh, Javanese uh, uh, Chris knives and so forth, you see. So, there were, but the thing to remember is, uh, the attitude of the king. There's no, no real discrimination there. Now, Raja Singha also, under the influence of his mother and the Christians, he was educated by Christian friars and by Buddhist monks. You see, I don't think either the Buddhists at that time, the Christians may have found something contradictory there, but the Buddhists didn't. You see, there's nothing unusual about that. And certainly there's nothing they could do about it because of Dona Katharina, you see. Uh, and uh, many of these, uh, uh, he could speak, you had to make a distinction between the Portuguese whom he hated, absolutely hated, and the friars, you see, with whom he could get on well. They were gurus, and like gurus, he had learned to respect them. Now, the Candian villagers 
were there for a veritable display of diverse humanity. And here's one source. <coughs> Among these Sinhalese, there live many Moors, Turks, and other heathens who all have special laws. Brahmas are there in large numbers who are very superstitious and respected by other nations. These Brahmas never eat anything that has life. Additionally, we know from the ethnographic evidence there are dozens all over the place, chock a block with Hindu mystics of all types, on these pantarams, I mean, people just wandering around in the Candian landscape. One uh, source says, uh, Dutch source says, that when he came to Candy, he was received very, uh, well, received well and accompanied to the city by some thousand armed soldiers of all nationalities, such as Turks, <coughs> Moors, Sinhalese, Kafirs, renegade Portuguese. You see? So, it's a real uh, <laughs> no, just a minute. Anyhow, it's good. So you see then therefore uh, the, the interesting thing here that these people are not just Buddhists, they are also sort of sympathetic to other religions and so forth and so forth. And uh, but that's a that's what I call cosmopolitanism. It didn't last all that long. Now I'm going to deal with uh, plenty of time, right? Okay. Deal with what I call a regime shift in the Candian Kingdom. But this is a, not a bad regime shift, you see. Raja Singha is very difficult to deal with this king because he lived for 50 years, you see, and he was a very powerful king. <coughs> so anyway, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, his son was a very gentle king, Vimaladama Surya, the second of the king. Brought up by, by this time, the king Sir Raja Singha himself married uh, two queens or more, probably, from Madurai, you see. And so did Bimala, uh, the second Vimaladharma Surya. And so did his son Narendra Singh. So there was a series of marriages. So that the implications of that, you see, uh, you know, are many. You see. It's not just nasty people coming from uh, Madhura in, in here and corrupting the Buddhists, you see. Not at all. Now what happened is that and the Dutch were in, in power at this time, and the Dutch sort of person to really the Dutch were liberals in their own country, but utterly illiberal uh, in Sri Lanka. The complete Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese persecutions were all over the place. Uh, the friars were banished, you see. King, uh, uh, kings were told not to bring them in, you see, and uh, it was really quite difficult. Here then you had a terribly important shift in Sri Lankan <coughs> society and culture with a huge influx of Portuguese as well as Sri Lankan Catholics, you see, largely due to the impact of a very, very important missionary Konkani Brahmin, jo Joseph Vaz, V A Z, Joseph Vaz. Joseph Vaz was uh, strongly influenced by Francis Xavier, whom probably most of you know, who was one of the first people uh, to join the Society of Jesus. You see, and and he went um, into became also the first Asian missionary. Joseph Vaz was a very interesting figure who converted the people, the, the people who were <coughs> held in low esteem in what is called the fishery coast, the coastal areas coming down from parts of uh, 
uh, Andhra Pradesh into the Tamil Nadu area, you see. The fishery goes, massive conversions, you see. And some of it is quite interesting. Why? Well, because uh, the man's insight was that he was just like a, though he wore black, he had the model of a Hindu sannyasi. Wore tattered clothes, you know, slept in one place, uh, you know, and lived, you know, had one meal a day. So, very interesting kind of uh, thing. And his conversion was he's really quite remarkable. Often my hands are paralyzed with baptism. You see, can you imagine that? About the mukwas, in one month I baptized 10,000 verses, I'm sorry, persons. I don't think, <coughs> these texts are full of such things, Portuguese texts, these texts, including some Sri Lankan texts. I borrow, <coughs> I borrow a phrase from my friend Arjuna Padore and call it, I don't know whether he like it, the magic of large numbers. <laughs> <laughs> these large numbers are very, very important. It inflates the greatness of these kings. You go to Madurai, and even good people like my friend uh, Narayana Rao misses the large numbers that are mentioned there, you see. You can't take them at face value. Um, so he then adopted this Christological uh, model, and of course, uh, for the, for the very poor and the depressed people in this area, he had enormous success, no one doubts about it. But, that's a but here, he n didn't know any local languages, you see. He had to use interpreters. Another Jesuit called Don Peter, whose work I use here, mentions that uh, he called, at that time it's perfectly normal, called uh, Hindus demon worshippers, you see. Um, well, it's a movie or something. <laughs> Anyhow, the militancy, which is characteristic of some of these uh, Catholic, uh, were very, very strong. Don Peter says he failed to see that the images used in non Christian religions were pretty much like what the Hindus use. You see, images, you know, icons. What is worse, on one occasion he made children seize the idols and smash them into bits, then spit upon them and trample for them underfoot. You see. So, um, and those who made idols he banished from the, from the villages. Different it was. There was a big difference. Joseph was came into a different kind of territory, Candy. He was just a, a friar, you see. Uh, you know, I mean, kings welcomed him because of course the background of Catholicism in the families, you know. Kings welcomed him. But there was no, there was no way he could sort of enter into that kind of discourse. No way. On the contrary, he realized that he was a guest in the Candian kingdom. That insight helped him a lot because the Candian kings at this time, Vimaladha Masuri II and his son Narendra Singh, also a very interesting figure, demonized not by the Catholics but by the Sinhalese, you see. Narendra Singh and this one welcomed them, you see, had conversations with them, talked about them in the same way they would have talked about matters of the doctrine with the Buddhist monks. There's nothing really strange about it, you see. So, Joseph was, uh, was a different kind of person, very familiar with uh, both Tamil and uh, Portuguese, a little bit of the Sinhala, but he didn't know too much of Sinhala, but later on he picked that up, you see. Very, very, uh, and also following uh, Xavier's model, he adopted the Sanyasi style, you see beautiful descriptions of this man, you know, going into remote areas, living, in, you know, dying on the floor, uh, and so forth. So that, of course, had a powerful impact 
from the Sangala people, with, be they Buddhists or whatever it is, you see, this is a model they were familiar with, you see. Forget the black that the guy wore, you see, you know. So he had an enormous impact on, uh, and now King Jin, Kandyan kings did, uh, uh, had nothing um, against proselytization, you know. So, now the question is, some Catholic uh, priests, uh, uh, scholars, have said that, um, you know, this girl, the kings were more sympathetic to Catholicism than Buddhism. Not so. Actually, one Catholic source uh, in a report uh, uh, puts it quite well that, I quote it, in an authoritarian uh, report. It says that though the king of Kandy is zealous for his religion, he has permitted the fathers to perform public acts of Christian devotion and feast. You see, so it was very clear that uh, they were Buddhist kings, but they allowed these guys a considerable <coughs> leeway. Now, now I find I will be a little bit nasty. Vimalakarma Surya II is a very gentle person, um, um, quite unlike his warrior father. Who, uh, and um, badly castigated by patriotic Buddhist scholars. One of the most important of our authorities on the candy period is Lorna Devaraja, the former scholar, and she condemns the king for his inadequate support of Buddhism. This is not Vimaladama Surya, but his son, Narendra Singha. I skip a bit of Vimaladama Surya because Narendra Singha is really one of the most interesting of the kings. Very complex character, utterly bad press. <laughs> So she says, people didn't like him because of his inadequate support of Buddhism. You see, the prejudice there. This guy was very sympathetic and open to other, other religions, you know. And she goes on to say, because it has always been the duty of the king to maintain the continuity of the Sangha by holding annual ceremonies of ordination. That is, what she's saying is this. <coughs> Very often in the history of Sri Lanka, the, or <coughs> the ordination had lapsed. Vimala Dharma Surya, the first, got monks from Arakan in Burma to renew the ordination. After that, 50 years of Raja Singh, he just didn't give a damn about ordination. <laughs> I, I have the reasons for that, but I want to, don't want to get into that here. And, uh, then his son, Vimaladharma Surya, you see, also had an uh, ordination renewed from uh, Arakan, had 33 monks, fully ordained monks, and 120 novices, you see, came. Yeah. But the trick of the thing is that this didn't last very long, you see. <coughs> For some reason, when Vimaladharana Surya became king in 1707, you see, there were, you know, he in, brought into his palace uh, uh, many novices, you see, a lot of novices, and treated them well, you see. And the indication is that there were some fully fledged monks also, fully ordained monks also there in his reign. But by 1714, boom, it's gone away, you see. I have reasons, economic, political, to see why that happened. I want, don't want to uh, get into that here, but if you want to read my uh, monstrous text, uh, you can, I have a discussion on that. Now, so in addition to uh, Devaraja's criticism of the king, is his partiality, and his partiality for Catholics and the alien Nayakas, you see, the support of the Nayakas 
was the cause of resentment against the king. And she said, there was one rebellion against. But when I look at the data, that was only rebellion. So he's better off than most of the other kings who had more than one rebellion. You see? So for some reason, people didn't think he was such a bad guy. He wasn't. Now it is time to recognize why Narendra Singha, you see, is treated in this way by Sri Lankan historians. If he was a crypto-Catholic, that's how they think of him, in the guise of a Buddhist, he would not have provided accommodation to the Samaneras in his own palace, you see. He went in all the pilgrimage places, he would have more than other kings. He repaired the temple, the left of the tooth relic, and had beautiful paintings there, and the paintings are described actually, you see. So you can't simply say that he is just a, just a, the Catholic in the Buddhist, uh, the Catholic in Buddhist guy is just nonsense. That's another reason why the Narendra Singha uh, is given this bad press. As I told you, that you can't have a big palace in Kandy. He moved his capital on the river banks of Kundasara and built a magnificent palace, you see. Magnificent. So there's no problem there, you see. As long as you move out of that orbit of the uh, palace of the two threads. And so then, what is then, he's called Selam Rajuru, playful king. Now that word has been picked up by you local know, scholars to imply that this was a you know, guy screwing around in his palace. There's nothing else to do, you see? I mean, but Selam does not mean simply eroticism. That was part of it, sure enough. But Selam means art, music, you see, all those kinds of things. And the kings, not just Narendra Singha, but his uh, pre predecessors, had uh, what is called a Kavikara Madhuva, a hall for poetry and dance, you see. So that's the, the modern sort of singers whom unfortunately we have to interact with, you see, feel that there's something wrong with eroticism. At least I don't believe there's something wrong, you see. Anyhow, uh, Narendra Singh's uh, Selam did incorporate erotic practices uh, in the, in the version that I have with uh, Praveen, I have a whole appendix on the kind of erotic text that he was employed as a wonderful stuff. <laughs> you read it, you see. <laughs> um, so, in these erotic texts, basically, it is uh, uh, the king's, the longings of uh, the women to have uh, sexual intercourse with the king, and also with his uh, grandfather, Raja Singha II. So, why is this? I attribute this to the development of what I have labeled in my work as Protestant Buddhism. We are in the late 19th century, after, the, after and after, Protestant values have been transformed as true Buddhist values under the influence of colonialism. I cannot deal with this phenomenon here except to state that those of us educated in colonial times and among Buddhist neo-colonials of our time, it, have, it would have been unthinkable that Buddhist kings, not just poor Narendra Singha, would engage in these practices. Some of them are very, very interesting. We know that. Some of them are communal, what's called uh, water sports. Water sports. We are the kings frolic in the water along with ordinary people. Unfortunately, the classic Pali texts composed by monks do not mention erotic practice and popular uh, temple dances all over the place, you see, because such forms of life were hardly the stuff of monastic interest 
and surely not conducive, I quote, to the serene joy and emotion of the pious, that is, every, every chapter is headed in the hundred, there are hundred chapters in the Mahavansa, each chapter is, is, this is written for the serene joy and emotion of the pious, <laughs> not just, not the kind of thing that Narendra Singh would uh, approve, I think. Uh. So it's eroticism that doesn't work for these monks. But when you move from the monks who composed these, uh, these uh, Mahavansa texts, you move into the monks who wrote poetry. They were monks. Full of temp references, beautiful references everywhere in these texts to temple dances, you see, all over the place. In the Vishnu temples, in the Shiva temples, all over the place. And indeed, not only that, you see, we know from uh, the evidence that I have collected, one of the kings, Prakram Bhava IV, a very, very interesting, very intelligent king, it's called Pandita Prakram Bhava, you see, he uh, had temple dances in the very temple uh, palace of the Tutra. Because the Buddha is Raja, and Rajas have dances, you see. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine people being sort of horrified if I, if I mention it, of course I will. <laughs> now I go to certain further sort of uh, admixtures. Do I have time? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And that is the Madurai connection. Raja Singh II married two or three women from Madurai because, you see, Madurai was quite well known to the Singhala kings. Vimala Dharma Surya had a, uh, had a regiments of about three, three the first Vimala Dharma Surya had the Madurai regiments, about 3,000 people in his court, uh, you see, in defense of the Kanyan kingdom. Later on in the reign of Raja Singh, you see, uh, uh, again you had a candy, uh, uh, Madurai regiments there. So it's not an alien thing. And these Madurai regiments didn't fly back to New York City or where it is. They stayed put, you see, and married single women, I'm sure. It was stupid if they didn't, <laughs> you see. The thing is, uh, you, you see, the Madurai, in, in other words, ma instead of, we had to recognize that the Madurai people were, re were well known to the Kandyan people. You see, there's nothing unusual about that. And what is even more interesting is, Raja Singh II, in my reanalysis, of course, you have to take it on trust at this point, you see, married the daughters of another great uh, king from Madurai, Tirumala. Tirumala, you see, it's Tirumala who sent the regiments to Rajasinghe. So Rajasinghe therefore cemented the marital relationship, sorry, <laughs> martial relationship <laughs> with a marital one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, then his son also married uh, Madurai women and his son Narendra Singha, by this time Madurai was in steep decline. He didn't get the best of the, the cream of the crop, but he got some, some guys coming from Madurai, and he married them also. What's the implication of this? The implication of this is that our scholars and those who write even these good texts have ignored the role of women, you see. These, after all, look at this. Right, uh, women of Dharma Surya's uh, women, uh, Raja Singh married uh, Madurai women, therefore women, the second women of Dharma Surya was partly Tamil or Telugu, Telugu mostly. Then if his son Narendra Singh uh, married and more, uh, <laughs> they will also be even more genetically more Madurai or Tamil than Singhala. You see? So it is a misnomer as all these, every single scholar calls Narendra Singhala the last Singhala king. What kind of Singhala? <laughs> you see?
see? What is more is, if you take my hypothesis that women are very important socializing agents, you see, all these women, after all, these kings may fight their battles and they do all sorts of other things. These are women who brought up children, you see? So we have to recognize the role of mothers in the socializing of children. And that is certainly true of uh, Dona Katarina, you see. She was the one who brought up the kids. No wonder they had sympathy for Catholics, you see. We have, uh, I mean, it doesn't, it's not just a, a singular prejudice. You read any text on this, women don't enter the picture, you see. So I'm suggesting uh, uh, the importance of the Madurai connection is not what the singular scholars think it is. That is, this guy is the first singular king. Not at all, you see. Here's a guy who was nurtured in, uh, by Madurai women. Now look at it again a little bit more. The Devaraja and all these people, mention the fact that these Nayakas, the next king was a Nayaka king. The king's brother was Sri Vijaya Raja Singha, who is a court Nayaka. So these scholars like uh, Devaraja mentioned, they were aliens in race, religion, and culture. Excuse me, the goose flesh, you see. Now, who was Sri Vijaya Raja Singha? You see, when his Sri Vijay Raja Singha was born in Sri Lanka, raised in Sri Lanka, you see, and it is hard to believe that he could be, uh, uh, he, he was ignorant of Buddhism because he was trained by Buddhist monks, you see. Uh, so there is, there is no problem there, you see. And what is, even if he was, remember uh, another thing to, we had to remember, he was a good Buddhist. The Mahavansa extols his Buddhism. So just because he's a Nayaka, how could he be alien? The other thing to recognize is that why did he become, why was he made king? He was made king because at this time, <laughs> this young kid, you see, was a favorite of Narendra Singha. So Narendra Singha, in effect, adopted this kid. So those who write history say, oh, there was conspiracies and so forth, and that's why, you know, the Nayaka conspiracies and that. Nothing at all. The king loved this guy and had him crowned as king, you see. And he was a perfectly good Buddhist. And what is even more interesting is that his, the, he married Nayaka women, you see, and brought them to the court. When he married them, these Nayaka women were more Buddhist than the Buddhists. You see? There's nothing unusual about it. After all, they were mostly Vaishnavites or uh, Shaivites. But after all, if you're a Vaishnavite, you see, uh, the Buddha is the ninth avatar of, uh, of Vishnu. What's the big problem there? So they can move from one. And, the, and from the Buddhist point of view, Vishnu was a kind of avatar of the Buddha. The, you know, the text, Buddha, popular text say, Matu Buddhvenna to the, to the, the Lord who will be future Buddha, to Vishnu. You see? So, that's not a, not a great problem. What is even more interesting is, these Buddha, uh, the, the Mahavansa you know, had a beautiful account of their piety. I went through the all hundred chapters of the Mahavansa. There is not one account as detailed as this on female piety. You see. So this is this is the alien kings that we are talking about. I'll take ten minutes more or five minutes. Yeah. <coughs> now there's a problem. The problem is the Catholics come back with the Rangers. <laughs> Here's the problem. Sri Vijaya, uh, you see, after Joseph Vaz, when Joseph Vaz di uh, died in 1711, 
don't go to these numbers, you see. Sometimes I have to move to the Joseph Alstein. Uh, soon, a new kind of uh, Konkani Brahmin came, uh, Gonsalves, Jakob Gonsalves, you see. A different kind of person, you see. Now, Vimala Dharma Suri, uh, Narendra Singh, which is Catholicism in the, in the broad sense, you see, that is cosmopolitanism, welcomed them. And uh, they were not, no threat to it, you see. But for a long time, I can't remember how many years I had to check this, Narendra Singer was ill, you see. And he had got Dutch physicians come, no, no. The country was run by his adopted Sri Vijay, you see. Dutch sources called him the crown prince. <laughs> well, uh, so that, in effect, he was a kind of crown prince. He was running the country for some time, you see. Now, the thing about Joseph, uh, uh, Father Jacob, um, sorry, Gonzalez, is that he was a new kind of, not new, of course, he's there in Catholicism for a long time, including uh, Xavier. He was a militant kind of uh, Catholic. Ignoring the fact that he's living in the Kandyan kingdom, you see, you know. So, but on the credit side of this thing, he was a superb literary figure. <coughs> and he is responsible for Catholic hymns, Catholic poetry, Catholic discourses. He wrote a lot. And one, some of the, what he wrote was very critical of Buddhism, you see. So, he gave one text called Budumula, roots of Buddhism, you see, to the crown prince, because he's the power now in the land. And the crown says, I'm crown to, to read and says, crown, naturally, he's a Buddhist, he says, what the hell is this, you see? So, so you get then, what is really happening is a new kind of uh, discourse, which I point, it's a three-way discourse, you see? Here you have the new, new Catholics, you have the Dutch who hated them and was trying to undermine them at any point, you see. And you had the emergence of a very important charismatic leader, Saranankara, who was a uh, novice at that time but highly educated, you see, and wanting Dutch help to get the uh, Thai ordination instituted. Anyhow, what therefore happens then is a very, very strange statement, or perhaps not so strange, in the in the Mahavansa. I quote this. Here it is. This is a Chula once coming out with the Buddhist viewpoint. So almost brutal in its way uh, they put it. The infamous Parangis, that is Portuguese, the infidels, the impious ones, who at the time of King Raja Singha, Raja Singha II, had still remained behind in the town and now dwelling here and there, rich in cunning, endeavored by gifts of money and the like to get their creed adopted by others, lead a life without reverence of the doctrine of the Buddha. When the king heard thereof, he became vehemently indignant, issued commands to the dignitaries, had their houses and their books destroyed and banished from the country those who did not give up their faith. Very serious statement. Now, what I did was, therefore, to unscramble that statement. <coughs> and I find that what is really happening is that coming in of Gonzalves, the emergence of texts that are critical of the Buddha, you see, and the monks, therefore, uh, sort of antagonists, you see, 
along with the with the Dutch. <coughs> Here I believe. Thus there seemed to be a three-way antagonistic discourse, and further research is necessary to fully understand its dynamics. Some information is available from Portuguese sources, but they are characterized by a virulent and hostile anti-Dutch and anti-Buddhist polemics by those missionaries who flocked to Candy after Gonzalo. This comes out beautifully in a document entitled Report of the Mission of Ceylon and must be read in full. According to the Portuguese, the villains were not so much the Buddhists, but the Dutch. The Dutch were the true villains, you see. And there's a lot of <coughs> anti-Calvinist discourse, you see, totally condemning <coughs> both Protestantism and so forth. So, the point of this Dutch source is that the Dutch sort of incited the kings, you see, and therefore, uh, and especially the Dutch ambassador, whom is, who is listed as our deadliest enemy, you see. And the net effect of this, of course, is that uh, you have what Bezos calls schismogenesis, that is, when one group takes a certain position, the other group takes a hostile position, and this leads to an incremental dialectic. <coughs> so <coughs> that's what happened. <coughs> so <coughs> one might say that's the end of, at least not the fully end of it, because the, the Catholic mission is then went the, from the Kandyan area towards a more desolate northern area called the Bangui, <coughs> and there they continued. And some of them would have stayed in Kandy. Rid of them all. And the final <coughs> last two words. Can I sit here? Yeah, of course. <coughs> <coughs> now we know uh, why the, uh, <laughs> the, in other words, that blunt and brutal statement that from the Chula ones has its reality, you see. It is. Uh, there was discrimination. The churches were surrounded. The friars were chased, and there was some real, real nasty stuff. But what is interesting about it, you can't say X is the culprit, or Y is the culprit, or Z is the culprit. What I point out is a three-way discourse: there's Dutch, there's the uh, Catholics, there's the Singers. You see? And the last thing that I want to show you is the, the nail, in the, you know, in the head, so to speak, is in the reign of the next Nayaka king, uh, Kirtrisi Rajasinghe, who was much more Nayaka than Sri Vijaya, you see, who was really a Buddhist. So you can't lump all the Nayakas together. And he was also a great king, very Buddhist, but he was also very Shaivite. So people condemned him because he used to rub ash all over his body, you see. Uh, but singular people also did that, but on special occasions, not all the time. Uh, you see, so you can rub ash some other time, but if you rub it all the time, then you're in trouble, you see. So um, anyhow, what really happened in the reign of, uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, Nayaka model that they had in Madurai, and I have descriptions of it, where you had religious, uh, the rituals of kingship, you see, highly elaborate. Outsiders <coughs> were not permitted to come, you know? And uh, this model was adopted by Keith Sri. Unthinkable in the traditional Kandyan kings, including uh, Sri Vijay, you see. People could come, people could go, they're not a big deal. But with this model, you see, you had the notion that um, 
a highly ceremonial king, uh, notion of kingship, with the king, so to speak, as a, as a kind of mystical uh, figure. And, and so unthinkable, you see. Whereas we know from the earlier descriptions, foreigners just come, came in plenty, well, well treated, you see. Not only that, the new rules were established. No one could have a two-story house. Out taboo. So the kind of houses that we were familiar with uh, in the in Vimala Dharma Surya, the first, simply not allowed. You see, you couldn't beat drums except unless you are uh, in the temple outside a skan. You see, Sri Lankans love to beat drums. You know all. Uh, and uh, people couldn't wear shoes, slippers, nothing, you know, in the premises, in the premises, you see. So you had another model of kingship, but then finally put the nail, what do you say, hit the nail, not on the head, you see. Okay, that's it.